Hello, it's Keith here and this is lesson 5 of the 6809 assembly programming tutorials. We've been over a wide variety of commands over the last few lessons and we're coming to the last one for a while now, lesson 5. We're basically going to look at all the other major commands we've not covered yet. Now first of all we're going to be discussing something known as logical operations and these are bit based operations that affect all of the bits based on a parameter. Now we're going to be doing commands like AND, OR and what's known as EOR on this system. On some it's known as XOR, but on the 6809 it's known as EOR. And this is where we have the bits in one of our registers, one of the accumulators. We then use a parameter and the resulting bits will be a combination of the two based on some kind of logical transformation. Now in the case of AND, the result will be a one where both of the past bits were one. If it was an OR, then it will be if either of the bits are one, and if EOR, it will be the inversion of the original bits. Now, effectively, this means that AND will set the resulting bit to zero when the parameter's bit is zero, OR will set the resulting bit to one where the parameter's bit was one, and EOR will flip the bits where the parameter's bit was one. Now, if you don't understand these, don't worry, because we're going to see examples and hopefully it will become very clear. Anyway, let's go over to today's source code and let's see what we've got to look at. So the first we're going to be doing is the logical ops. Now we have three commands we're going to be looking at in each case. One works on accumulator A, which we're going to see as binary. One works on accumulator B, which we'll see as hexadecimal. And one works on the condition codes. Now um, on a lot of systems, you might have a set carry flag command, a clear carry flag command, things like that. On the 6809, we actually use and and or on the condition codes to set and clear the bits because as I said before, where a bit is zero in an AND command, you are effectively setting that bit to zero within the result, the destination register, in this case, the condition codes. And with an OR command, if there is a one in that position, you're effectively setting that bit to one. So the AND CC and OR CC can be used to set and clear bits in the condition codes. And that's what we'll be looking at today. Okay, well let's fire up this example and let's have a look at what the results of our commands will be and then we'll go over the commands and explain why those results have occurred. Okay, let's just lock this onto the top here and let's go through each line and what we've done. So here what we've done is we've loaded in a test value into A and B here and then what we've done is we've done an AND with the top four bits as one to each of these registers. So you can see here that at the start here, the A register contained 1100-1101 and B contained CD and the condition codes contained, well, just to the end flag set, basically. Now, we've then done an AND with four ones and four zeros, effectively with the top nibble all as ones, so an F, and the bottom nibble all as zeros, effectively a zero. When an AND occurs, where both bits are one, the bit will be retained, but where both, bits were not one, either one was a zero, the result will be a zero. So this is effectively cleared these four bits of the register and retained these four bits of the register. So you can see here, A was 1100, 1101. Well, these four bits here and the bottom half have got lost, but the top four bits have been retained but unchanged. So it's still 1100, but the bottom four bits have now become zero. The same has occurred to the CD here. The CD has now become a C0. And you can see here that the end bit, because it was in the bottom four bits that were anded with zeros, they've been lost. If there were any bits in the top half set, they would have been retained because of the ones here. So the end will retain where there's a one and it will set to zero where there's a zero. Now that's and, or is kind of the opposite, if you will. Basically, whatever is in the top half where the zeros are has now been unchanged. So you can see 1100 here has been left unchanged and the C here has been unchanged and these zero bits have been unchanged in the CC. But the bits that are one in the parameter have been set in the resulting register. So A used to be 1101 in the bottom half. It's now 1111 because of these odd bits here. And C, D has become CF because of course four one bits are in F. And you can see all of those flags were set down here as well, because again, because of the ones here. So that's and and or for effectively clearing bits and setting bits, you could think of it that way. But we've also got EOR or XOR as it's on some systems. EOR is nothing to do with donkeys. It stands for exclusive OR. And this is effectively flipping the bits. I do prefer the name XOR, it's more sensible to me. But anyway, basically where the bits are one, the 
bits will be flipped in the result. So you can see here 1100 has been unchanged because the bits were zero and 1101 has been flipped to 0010, effectively the inversion, because of these one bits here. Now, of course, if the bits were zero, they would have been left unchanged, but because all these four bits were one, the four bits were flipped here, and the same has happened here. The C is unchanged. The D has been changed to a two because that's the inversion, and we have no equivalent for the condition code here because we don't really need to do that kind of thing very often. Flipping them, we usually want to set condition codes to a known state. Now, Eeyore will flip individual bits, but there will be often cases where we need to flip all of the bits in one go. And because this is a two byte command, we do have a quicker one byte command here, com complement. And this is just effectively the same as Eeyore with eight one bits or Eeyore 255 here. So you can see here that the bits were 1100101, -1 and then the complement occurred and they became 00110010. The CD became a 32, and that's the result of the complement there. Now, just to make the point, if I change this to being all ones here, I just copy that to B as well, where you're now going to see that the result will be the same from the EOR as the complement because they are effectively now the same command. You can see because we flipped all of the bits here and complement flips all the bits by default, you can see these two now are the same value, but this is a two byte command and this is a one byte command. So the one byte command is obviously going to be faster and save you a little bit of memory. Now, there is one other thing that you will want to do and that's negation. Now in hexadecimal, the way we do negation is we effectively flip all the bits in a register and we add one. And the reason for this, if you don't know, is when we want to subtract a number in hexadecimal, basically if we've got the value 10, we want to go down to the value nine. Now, if we add 255 to 10, it will rotate all the way around and end up one lower than where it started. So 255 and minus one are effectively the same thing. And it's just the way our comparisons work. We looked at this previously depending on whether 255 is a high positive number or a small negative number. Now, if we want to negate a number, we could use complement and then we could use add one. That would have the valid effect. But of course, that would be wasteful, a lot of commands there. So we've got a single command neg and that will convert a positive to a negative. So F6 is negated and that becomes zero A and then it's negated again, it becomes back to F6. And you can see here that effectively all of the bits have been flipped except this bottom bit because we've added one has been unchanged in this example. Now, if I just change this example from 10 and minus 10, if I just change it to one and minus one, we will get that example I described where we've got basically 255 is minus one. So you can see these are the same value here. And of course, if I change them to zero, well, negating zero just gives us zero. So you can see that as well. So that we're getting the results we would expect there. So these are the various options for flipping bits, for setting bits and clearing bits using these logical operations. And negation isn't really a logical operation, but it's so related to complementing, which itself is basically an E or command type command. Okay, so that's our logical bit operations. Next, we're going to look at rotation. Now, rotation is something we have to do quite a lot in assembly. It's especially useful because if you think about it, when you shift all of your bits to the left, you're effectively doubling a number. Uh, if you think of the bottom bit, the bottom bit has a value of one and the bit next to it has a value of two and the bit next to it has a value of four. So every time you shift a bit to the left, you're doubling the value. And that works, of course, for three or five or any number in hexadecimal. If you shift it to the left, you're doubling it. If you shift it to the right, you're halving it. Now, the only exceptions to that come if your number is negative because of what I described before, 255 is effectively minus one. And if you shifted it to the right and put a top bit of zero, well, it would suddenly become 127. It would become a very high positive number rather than a negative number. And we need special commands to deal with that. And that's what we're going to see now. But anyway, apart from halving and doubling numbers, bit rotation is also very important for other things as well. And quite often you might want to do things like read in data from a hardware register. You may be like a joystick uses the top two bits of an address and you need to get those into the bottom two bits for whatever purpose your game needs. And we often want to do rotations and things to do that kind of thing as well. So we're going to look at a variety of rotation commands and we've got this little looping code that's going to show us the effect of each command one by one. Okay, so here's our first one, and this is arithmetic shift. Arithmetic shift right, we're doing it on the accumulator A here, and it's arithmetic shift left again on the accumulator A here. And we've just got some test bits here that are varied enough to, for us to see clearly the result of these shifts. 
Now, arithmetic shifts are designed for signed numbers, and it's that thing of, as I said, if we shift to the right, we're halving the number. If we shift to the left, we're doubling the number. And arithmetic shift right and left are used for signed numbers where we need that top bit to stay the same because as long as the top bit stays the same during the operation, the sign will be intact and halving a negative number will work if we're shifting to the right. So here you can see we've got our signed number here and we're effectively shifting to the right each time. And you can see all of these bits are moving along, but the top bit is staying the same here. And that means the sign is staying the same. Now that's arithmetic shift right, because you can see the zeros are moving to the right, and the number is effectively halving each time. Arithmetic shift to the left will effectively double the number. Of course, there is going to be a problem here. If we push too many bits off the left-hand side, the, the number will become invalid, and that's actually happened very quickly here. But with a smaller number, it would work much better, for example, if, um, for example, if we had a number like minus three here and we run again, well, you can see here that the arithmetic shift left will be valid all the way up to this point. It's only at this point where the um, sign has flipped because we've run out of bits. Now we could um, get around that by using two registers together into a 16-bit value, but as I say, in this case, shifting to the left here has actually lost our value. Now the same is of course true when we shift to the right, we're effectively halving the value and at some point our detail will be lost as well. So that's arithmetic shift right and arithmetic shift left. Now you can see the top bit is being maintained, which means a negative number will stay negative. But if we use a positive number, the top bit is also maintained here. It's just in this case, it's maintained as a zero. So that's what's happening there. Now, as well as arithmetic shift, we do also have logical shift. Now this is the effectively the unsigned version of this command. So rather than retaining the top bit and keeping the sign, logical shift does nothing of the kind. It just shifts the bit and uh, the top bit will shift along just like any other. So you can see here, whereas before, when we were shifting to the right, the top bit was re retained as a one and any extra bits that were fill being filled in were also taking the same value as that top bit. Well, now when we're shifting, the bits are just moving along and the new bits are being filled with zeros. Now, actually, um, logical shift to the left and arithmetic and arithmetic shift to the left are the effective same command. There is no difference between the two. It's only arithmetic shift right that ha is different from logical shift right because of re retaining that top bit so that the sign stays the same. So both of these are shifting and any new bits are being filled in with sort of either zeros or in the case of logical shift right ones if the top bit was originally one. So they are just shifting. There is no actual um, rotation. There's nothing coming back into the register. Now, one thing, however, it is worth noting is that if you look when a bit was pushed out of the register, for example, one was pushed out here, it's actually been pushed into the carry flag. And you can see here again, this bit was zero, so the carry, when it was pushed out, the carry was zero. But these bits were one, so they were pushed into the carry here. And you can see the same is true here as well. The carry bit is being set, and that means we can have a logical shift on a low part of a pair and then another shift on the high part. And if we push that carry into the high part, we can use a 16 bit or more set of registers and we can make, we can keep the lost bits from the shift command into that other register. Now we can look at that kind of thing by using the rotation commands. We're going to look at rotate left and we're going to look at rotate right now. Now let's have a look at these. Now these are much more relevant to the carry and these are also more useful if we need to move a bit that's very low in a register to a very high position quickly. So you can see here that we've got this bit pattern here and then we're shifting first to the right and then we're shifting to the left here. Now when we shift to the right you can see the bits are moving to the right but this bit here has been moved out into the carry here but then the carry has been moved back in in this position here and you can see that happening again here with these two bits here that have been pushed in here so the carry when we're shifting to the right is taking the new value of the top bit in the next shift and the old bottom bit is being pushed into the carry you can see these two zeros here have been pushed into the carry here these three ones here have been pushed into the carry here so each shift is effectively using the carry as the ninth bit and here we're shifting to the right, and here we're shifting to the left. And what we can effectively do is we can do our logical or arithmetic shift of the low part 
and then if we're shifting to the left we can then do a rotation on the high part and shift the carry into that high part so that our 16 bit pair will retain the bits that were lost from the low byte into the high byte and that will allow us to use numbers that are more than eight bits and still do this halving and doubling of registers via shifts so that's the difference between arithmetic shift and logical shift and rotation. Now on the 6809, the carry is always involved in the rotation commands. On some systems, the 68000, for example, there are options, but in 6809, rotation always uses the carry. It's just the way it works. Now we've been discussing signed numbers here, and now we um, have to come to the rather unfortunately titled SEX command, which stands for sign extend. Now this effectively extends a single register into a register pair. It will take the B register and extend the sign into the A register, effectively the D register, because remember the D is a combination of A and B where A is the high part and B is the low part. Well, let's fire this up and see what this rather unfortunately titled command does. Basically, what it will do is it will make the top register, the A part, have the same sign as the bottom register, the B part. Now, if you remember, the sign is effectively denoted by the top bit. So the bit seven of B will effectively fill the whole of A. Now, in the example of 64, the hexadecimal 40, the top bit was zero. So after we've run this command, the first A was 66, which was just an example. And so after the SEX command, the top byte has become zero because the top bit was zero here. But with the minus 64 hexadecimal C zero, the top bit was one. So when we did the sign extend command, the top byte became FF here. So which is, of course, minus 255, all the bits are one. So the sign has been extended from one byte, eight bits to two bytes, 16 bits. Just a simple command, but it's something you will need to do. So um, it's a command that's definitely worth knowing about. OK, so that's how we can sign extend. And we've also looked at rotation and logical operations. Well, what about if we want to test the content of a register without actually changing it? Well, we have the bit command and we can test individual bits or multiple bits using this bit command, but we will not change the registers in the process. Now, this is effectively the equivalent of an AND command. Um, it will set the zero flag, but it will not change the register. So we've loaded our test register A with one one in the bottom two bits here. And then we're going to do a variety of tests and set the flags accordingly. So first of all, we're going to test this bit here. Well, that bit in our test value is not zero. So the zero flag has not been set. Then we're going to test this bit, well, bit one is not zero, so that so the zero flag has not be, not been set. Then we're testing bit two here, and that's the bit just here. Well, that is zero, so the zero flag has been set. Now what we're doing here is we're testing one one here. Well, those two are definitely not zero, so the zero flag has not been set. And then finally, we're testing the top bit here, which of course is zero, so the zero flag has been set. Now, basically, this is just an AND command that doesn't change the registers. So we're effectively requiring both the bits we're testing, if we're testing multiple, or all the bits rather, to be zero for the Z flag to be set. So for example, in this case, that bit is not zero, that bit is zero, well, the result is going to be that the zero flag is not set because both the bits weren't zero, even though one of them was. And equally, of course, if we test lots of bits, well, all of those are zero, so the zero flag will be set. So as I say, it's effectively an AND command. It just doesn't change the register itself. So we can do multiple tests in a sequence and keep that register intact. Now, there is another special case, the T TST command, the test command. And this will test a register and set the flags accordingly. And this is, again, just a single byte command. So it saves a little bit of memory here. So we can do a test on the accumulator here, and this will set the flags accordingly. So we loaded A with zero and we did a test. So the Z flag was set here. Then we loaded A with one and we did a test while well, the Z flag has been cleared. And then we loaded A with minus one and we did a test. Well, that's not zero, but because the top bit is one, the N negative flag has been set. So this is the way we can set the flags based on a register. And this command, as well as a register, we can use it on a memory address here as well. You see, we can reset the zero flag here if we do a different address. We will get a different result. So say it's just 
This is a good way of setting the flags based on an address or a register without changing the register or without reading in from the address into one of our registers. So a very handy command for testing things. Now, one other command we're going to look at, which is a little bit obscure, but is definitely handy, is the decimal accumulator adjust command DAA. Now, this is for something known as binary coded decimal. A binary coded decimal sounds quite daunting, but it actually isn't. It's very straightforward and it's very logical. Think of your pinball machine or your game with a very large high score. You want to be able to show lots and lots of digits and you need to do your calculations very quickly. Converting 16-bit, 32-bit, 64-bit hexadecimal numbers into characters is going to be slow and a pain and you're not going to want to do that really. Now what you can do is you can kind of cheat. You can take your 8-bit number and rather than storing that as 0 to 255, you could store it as 0 to 99. The way we do this is we split the hexadecimal number into two nibbles and each one instead of going from 0 to F will now go from 0 to 9. This means that we can store our numbers very logically and it's easy to break these back down into a character representation for the screen. But what this does mean is all of our mathematical operations aren't going to work because when we do ad addition, because when we add 1 to 99, it's going to become a zero in hexadecimal. Well, the way we get around this is we've got a command called DAA and this will actually basically fix any alteration to the numbers in the registers and it will convert them from normal hexadecimal into this binary coded decimal. So here we've got a normal hexadecimal number here. We've loaded it with 8 here and then we keep adding 1 and instead of going 8, 9, A, it now is converted to 1, 0, 1, 1 and you can see it's going up as a pair of decimal numbers here. And that's because the decimal adjust command is fixing things basically. If we just change this and we change this to add 2 where you can see that works just fine as well. These look like normal decimal numbers. And so that's how we can use decimal adjust accumulator for binary coded decimal. Now we just looked at adding two there. Now what happens if we re remove our decimal adjust accumulator command here? Well, now of course we're just working in normal hexadecimal. So when we go over 09, we go A, C, E, 1, O. So that's how we can use the DAA command to work in binary coded decimal. And as I say, it's very handy if we are looking to do very large high scores. It's something I used in my grime game and in Chibi Akamas, it's very handy. So it's definitely something I would suggest you look at. Okay, so now we're going to look at the multiply command. Now the 6809 doesn't have a divide command, but it does have a multiply command and it's very straightforward. Basically, the multiply command will use the D double accumulator and it will multiply A and B together. Now if we just try this out here, We've taken hexadecimal 10 and hexadecimal 69 and we've multiplied them together and of course we get the value 690 here. We could change this to hexadecimal 20 here and you can see we've now got that value or of course we could change it to just 2 and we've now got this value here. So a very straightforward command, it will give us a 16-bit result from two 8-bit parameters and uh, it's you know, quite handy to have something like that on the um, 6502Z80. We don't have a multiply command, so um, anything upon, above that is quite impressive to us. As I say, we don't have a divide command. Of course, it's always worth bearing in mind that we can do these kind of things in some cases. You know, if we're doing multiplying by two or dividing by two, we can do these with our bit shifting commands, and that will actually, in most cases, be faster. So it's worth bearing those in mind as well. So there we go. So. That's all we're going to be covering for today. We've looked at a wide variety of commands with regards to bit shifting, testing, mathematics, that kind of thing. And hopefully at this point, you'll now know enough to be able to get started with the basics of programming the 6809. Now, you've probably actually been in this situation for a while anyway. So if you've not seen any of them so far, please um, take a look at my platform specific series in which we go into different systems and we look at the technicalities of working with the hardware, how to make sounds, how to draw graphics, how to read in put that kind of thing because um, whether you're looking at the Tandy Coco, the Dragon, the FM7 or the Vectrex, you're going to need to actually understand enough about the hardware to make something happen, whether it's some, a bit of graphics on the screen or read in from the joystick to make a game. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed what you've seen today. If you have, please like and subscribe because that kind of thing helps me out. But whatever you do, I wish you all the best with your future 6809 programming. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.